Hey everyone, welcome to this live webinar. So with me today, I have Victor Chung from The Fifth Person and we have a special guest uh, who's just made his very first appearance for this live webinar. I'm Adam, I'm the co-founder of The Fifth Person as well. So welcome to this live webinar. Before we begin, just want to make sure that you can see our three or two faces, because one of them is in disguise, <laughs> and hear my voice. And then if you can, just type yes in the chat box and we're going to start really, really soon. Yes, okay, so we see all of you saying yes, William. Well, okay, a lot of names, I'm not gonna say all of them, but welcome once again to this live webinar. And this is our monthly live webinar that we do where we take all your questions that you submit to us and we wanna answer as many of them as we can. So we're gonna pick the best questions that you submitted so far and we're gonna answer as many of them as we can over the next 45 minutes to an hour. If we don't pick your questions, so sorry about that, but we, you guys really sent in so many questions. And of course, if you have any questions along the way during the show, feel free to type in the chat box and ask us as well. So once again, Victor with me and AK of uh, ASSI fame. Okay, so I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the both of them and um, shall we get the, go the, the the ball rolling? Sure. Sure, all right, so AK has been very silent so far. Yeah. Very mysterious. Are you going to talk? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Ah, um, since AK, you're a special guest on this show, uh, and we're very happy to have you here. We're gonna just arrow you with the first question, really, okay? Uh, uh. So Karina has a question, so and it's specifically to you. Okay. All right. So she has a few questions. So let's just start with the first one. So looking back, what would you say was the turning point in your investing success and journey towards financial freedom? What are some of the key actions you took and decisions that you made right? Turning point, ah. I don't know, like. Uh, oh, it's very enlightening. <laughs> yeah, the turning point. I also cannot remember. Uh, you know, it's just doing the things that I always do, law. You know, uh, don't spend so much money. You make money, must save money. You make more money, save more money. Don't spend more money. You know, then as an investor, um, well, I was also a trader, lah. So trading, investing. <laughs> Uh, trading and investing is different. Uh. She only asked about investing, right? Yeah. Well, okay. What do you want to share about? As, yeah. as an investor, huh? as an investor, the global financial crisis was a rude awakening like, in many ways. I think many of us who were invested before, you know, that was really a big eye opener. Huh? Yeah, but of course, before that, there was also the Asian financial crisis, huh? but the global was uh, uh, somewhat more terrifying. Huh? Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, that one, uh, I think I have a blog post, you know, called uh, "Excuse Me, Are You an Investor?" You can go and search for that blog post in my blog. Huh? Uh, it's, it was inspired by Bonnie Hicks, lah. You know, "Excuse Me, Are You a Model?" Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I'm not model, lah, huh? So, um, because of that crisis, uh, I decided to beef up my knowledge of uh, technical analysis, fundamental analysis. So maybe that is. A turning point uh, you know so after that i i think i became a better trader and a better investor uh. mm. yeah but um actually i've always been lucky uh. mm. yeah so luck plays a part uh. so go to church regularly <laughs> if you are believing that or you know or like me i go temple regularly uh, a bit of luck doesn't hurt uh. okay uh. um you you share a lot of like like shares on your on your blog and everything of these companies. How do you, you know? She's asking, Karin is asking as well. How do you can you share your thought process in generating investment ideas? Investment ideas, ah. Yeah. How do you find the ideas like old oh, junkie and? Yeah la, and This sort of question Adam asked before many times already la. You know, uh, Victor also have answer. Right? I just got scuttlebutt no? You know, scuttlebutt sounds a bit vulgar. You know what? But here, but there, but then. Uh, base. <laughs> basically, you know, you have to observe and look at things around you and have a questioning mind, you know, hey, this business, how does it work and stuff like that. And I look at Old Chunky, of course, you know, they are in the food business and you can find them everywhere and always there's a long queue outside Old Chunky kiosk. And I say, wow, Old Chunky, uh, you know, being Kiam Siap AK, right? Wow, the curry puff price went up 10 cents again, you know. Other two, three months later, another 10 cents up, you know, keep going up in price, but people keep eating. Wow, mm -hmm. good business, you know. Then uh, restaurant business, uh, how come this restaurant no need space for table and chairs one? Wow, very good, only food kiosk. The cost must be quite low. So then I went and looked at all the financial statements from all the different FMBs, you know. I looked at quite a few public listed ones. 
and I find Old Chunky consistently profitable one. Okay. Uh, so this is you're basically just looking around for. Let's look fun. around, but then of obviously you cannot always be looking around and finding ideas. You know, sometimes I get ideas from following the news. Uh, mm. you know, so I'm a student of economics. You know, so I like to read and get updated on news. Okay. Like for example, why I decided to invest in Japan, Saizen read for example. You, know, you get updated on economics. Like for example, now why I still think it's good to invest in Japan, for example, so interest rates will stay low in Japan, even though interest rates going up in the US. So, you know, it's country specific stuff. So you, you have to be interested in news. Now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go ask some questions for Victor right now. So Rudy has a question. I, after buying a share at below NTA, okay, uh, how can I fi find out later whether this this is a value trap or not. Okay. Personally, I felt uh, if you want to buy a company, okay, uh, looking at just book value itself and buy below book value is not enough. So I used to do that in my early days and I got burned quite badly because just by focusing on numbers. But nowadays, what I do is I, I focus a lot on the, the business model of the company, okay, whether uh, they are recurring in nature, uh, whether uh, when they when they are dropped below book value, is it a temporary situation? Okay, and do they have cash position to buffer for this temporary situation? So so it, even though it drops below book value and or it, even it continue to drop our average down because I know that this they have a quite a quality business not not say quality let's say recurring business with good cash position and they are still paying out dividends so these are the things that i will, I will look at have you have you have you ever fallen into a value trap any examples um okay uh there's this company uh which and i used to invest in is is listed in in uh hong kong it's called 361 degrees a shoe company uh this company have uh I, if i guess one is Real mean P, and the valuation of this company is 800 million, 800 million million P, and the cash ratio is 800 million million P. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this company is selling at below book value, dividend yield of 8%, and increasingly paying dividend. The dividends are increasing. Okay, and yet this company turned out to be a value trap. Mm -hmm. Okay, firstly, is the business model. Okay, uh, shoe business in, in China is very, very competitive. If I've really gone down to China to scuttle back on this company, I would not have invested in this company because I remember uh, one time I was I was in Xiamen, okay, and I went to all the shoes shop. I can literally see the sales people right running towards me and said, "Zerko, Zerko, Zerko!" They shop discount, discount, and they pull me to buy their stuff. And this is how competitive the shoe market is in mm. in China, mm. okay. So if I realized the competitive landscape, I would not have gone in because. I think I I I hear say hear say because all oh, this this company is the like Adidas of of uh, China, China or something. Yeah. yeah, it's never the Adidas. When somebody told you say this company is the next Adidas or the next Nike or the next Persia Hardaway, it's never the next Persia Hardaway mm -hmm. or the next Adidas because there's there's only one company that is that and it's very unique. Just remember that. Yeah. All right, so it goes to show that even the best investors uh, can make mistakes at times, so yeah. we don't always pick. Pick winners every single time, so it's investing. So, so for, for, for a, management. Yeah, there's yeah. probability in this yeah. as well. All right, let's move on to another question by Uma. Uh, she has a few, uh, and either one of you can basically answer this question. I will just pick the first one. At any one time, how much of your portfolio is in stocks, and how much of it is under is under uh, not deployed, basically? Okay. Um. Personally, for me, is uh, I based on the market valuation to deploy my cash. So, like for instance, um, two years ago. Is it 2015? 2015, mm. the market was quite high in in my in the terms I look at the market, the valuation. Okay. So we are holding about 40% cash. And when it reached August, the China stock market crashed, and December, the oil price crashed, and the market becomes very cheap suddenly. And by January 2016, we are left with 1% cash, mm. or probably 3% sorry. Okay. And right now we are still in three percent cash. Okay, and the position that we have bought, all the most of the stocks have went up. Mm -hmm. So, so we increase and reduce our uh, cash position based on the market valuation. So, if the market get a bit more expensive, right, you you start seeing us trimming our stocks. 
and increasing our cash position. Mm-hmm. And when the market gets cheap, we will start to be fully invested. Okay. Right. All right. So it really depends on the valuation of, yes, of right. the market at the point yes. in time. So uh, I'm going to ask AK a question. I didn't know if you're still awake because you were not moving for the last five minutes <laughs> <laughs> until you nodded your head. So let's just give you another question. How about that? Okay. All right. Um, Harry has a question. So um, you have talked about reducing exposure to REITs you know, in view of rising interest rates. Um, what sectors or type of stocks are you looking at now for income investment since he, think, you know, he thinks most of your dividend stocks are... Since most dividend stocks have a lower dividend yield than REITs, would you invest overseas uh, or do you mostly invest in Singapore? Uh, I don't have any overseas stocks. Yeah. Uh, I'm a small fish, not big fish, so I don't go to the ocean. The pond is big enough for me. Uh, so I only have Singapore stocks. But SGX is not a local company. Uh, the one I don't know, I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, interest rates, right? Uh, actually, not all REITs are bad. Uh. No, because you talk about rising interest rate, why you're afraid uh, having a too big an exposure to REITs is because the cost of doing business for them will go up, the finance expense will go up. So if the finance expense goes up and their revenue doesn't go up to compensate for them, then of course the distribution per unit, the DPU would drop. Then of course your yield will drop. You know, um, so But if the REIT you're invested in is able to increase revenue, uh, to keep pace with the increase in interest rate to compensate or in fact do better than the increase in interest rate. There's no reason to be fearful of that rate. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. in general, yes, you know, rising interest rate will impact the profitability of REITs and the DPU, but uh, you don't have to avoid them totally. You know, um, then if you talk about non-REITs, you know, if you follow my blog, I have uh, I share about my uh, income from REITs and income from non-REITs. You can tell from my last report for the full year 2016 that my income from non REITs have gone up a lot uh, because I've been going there, uh, putting more money in non REITs. Um, so, one of my favorite is actually DBS. Mm-hmm. And I talk about this probably the entire 2016, I was talking about DBS because it was so undervalued. And uh, even today, I, I think DBS uh, is not as undervalued. For a fair value, I'm mm-hmm. waiting for the price to pull back before I buy some. Mm-hmm. Again, um, I didn't sell all. I, as the price went up, I, I sold uh, some of my investment in DBS. Um, but basically, how you want to pick? Uh, you pick market leaders, lah. You know, and companies which will not be affected badly by rising interest rates. So, and in fact, DBS will probably benefit from rising interest rate because uh, the interest net interest uh, the interest margin for them will improve. So their interest income will improve. And uh, DBS probably is the best proxy uh, for that. Lah. Then if you look at DBS, they pay out about one third of their earnings as dividend. So you, you still get dividend income and the balance that they don't pay out, they just retain earnings. So you look at DBS NAV, right? It's very amazing. Every year, the value goes up by more than a dollar. So even if you just hold the stock, right? every year, is getting more valuable. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah that's if you think about Singapore banks, they're very stable in a way. Mm, they are very safe. La. Singapore yeah. banks very are very safe. Highly regulated. Uh, mm. I didn't say that. Uh. So, uh, if <laughs> any of you work for, safe. work for government, uh, you remember not I say one. Yeah. 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 Okay. The government so, probably knows who you are. Though. Yeah. <laughs> so, currently, I have a position in DBS and OCBC. Right. Uh, UOB, I don't have. Mm-hmm. Uh, UOB, uh, not, I'm not saying it's a bad but a thing, you know, but then uh, UOB is a bit more conservative, lah, which yeah. would be a good thing. All right. Okay. So, yeah. again, not a recommendation to purchase any of oh, the no, 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 securities no. that we mentioned no, during no. this webinar. You, 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 so yeah, you read my blog, you, you see yeah. all these things anyway. Lah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's move on to another question by, well, let's pick another question here by Sandra. And either one of you can answer this one. So, let's go to the US now. How do you, do you look at investing in the Dow Jones Industrial Average? So the, the Dow, basically. Is it safer to invest in the Dow versus uh, Singapore, Malaysia markets since the USD is appreciating, all right? And uh, Trump is going to the White House. Uh, I mean, that, that is, anything happen with that. So what do you think? Personally, I think that the US market is very expensive right now. Yeah. So which is the reason why we are not invested in the US except for one company, okay? Uh, we are still... We are away from the US right now until they become much cheaper. But of course, you know, US valuation can go even higher than its current 
place. So for us, is we want to remain very fundamental. If you look at the valuation, uh, of course, the US index is a good place to invest because in the long run, they're always going up. The Asia, in the, uh, the Asia index are generally more volatile as not, and, and they do not perform as well as in the as compared to the US index. Okay, so, but if you want to invest in index, you still have to spread yourself. You cannot invest everything into the US index. You have to spread among the rest of the few index that you felt that economy will grow, like companies are probably like cut index, like Hang Seng index. Uh, the Singapore index and Malaysia index have been quite sideways in the past few years, but but generally it will go up in the long run. Mm -hmm. So please spread your, your risk among all the different index. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and for you, you don't invest overseas anymore? No, I only yeah. have the Singapore index. Yeah, this is a very sad life. Pro Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. Best place on earth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's take another question. Maybe before we go to the, I see a lot of live questions that we're going to have. So maybe we just want to answer some of the questions oh that, that we submitted, uh, those that submitted earlier. I don't think we can cover everything tonight because yes. you guys. So stop sending in questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can send them, but we I, there's no guarantee we'll pick them. But I mean, no guarantee. <laughs> guarantee we won't pick. We them. might have need to have another session just because you are around and everyone's here to see you. Flatterer, he just wants me to work. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, why not? Yeah. You're semi retired or something. I'm very busy nowadays, you know. Okay, I yeah. have to play my old Game Boy games, my PlayStation game. I have okay, 10, okay, years, yeah, 10 years to catch up, you know. Yeah, that's okay, um, let's see. Any, let's see if there's any question here. Um, Shoot AK, come on. AK, yeah. All right. Um, a lot of questions Giving some job to do for AK. Let's just see. Okay, uh, I think this is a really, really good question. Uh, Reddy has a question here. So he, he said, he said, I've heard a lot of stories from people about successful tr uh, traders, investors. Can you share, I mean, any mistakes that you've made along the way? I mean, Victor has shared one just now with 361 degrees. Uh, any mistakes that you've made along the way and, you know, um, how anything that you can learn, that you learned that you can share with our viewers today? Mistakes are, uh... yeah. So many law, which one to choose? The worst one. I cannot remember, <laughs> no. No, and no. I spent my entire life trying to remember all the mistakes, you know. Now you want me to grant dig out. Forget the mistake of memory. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, forget, correct. You see, <laughs> you see, I'm so traumatized by that question now. You know, the old wounds are opening up. So never ask your stockbroker for advice. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. You know, I remember once I was um I was also trading at one time, you know, and a half big trader in those days, you know, and uh, I remember it was a CK Tang incident. Uh, I say, so well, this CK Tang stock, uh, I think, uh, can, uh, can, uh, you know, something. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember what was the incident really. La. So I remember going in very, then the price went the other way. La. So I asked my broker and my broker say something. Oh, it's okay. Right? And so I, you know, when in the position became bigger and bigger until finally, right, when I can, couldn't take it anymore, I crumbled, you know, I was cold sweat, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, probably the head turned white overnight and stuff like that. I finally beat the bullet, took the loss. The loss was equivalent to my one year savings, you know. Wow. In those days, uh, as a young worker, uh, it was a lot, uh, really traumatized, really felt like chopping off my hands and never want to go back into the stock market again. You know, so don't ask barbers if you need haircut, uh, you know, not I say one, uh, someone <laughs> else say one. And uh, what other mistakes are? Uh, so many. La. Um, don't listen to friends whom you think are insiders. You know, so for example, I was invested in Raffles Medical. I got in at 50 cents. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. If I've helped you today, you just imagine. Uh, then I knew someone, a friend who's working in Raffles Medical. You tell me, ah, yeah, Raffles Medical, oh, the director's very sway one eye, oh, they well, treat the staff very bad, like, oh, this hospital could die already. Work inside, right? Not insider, ma, can trust law, but not everyone work in the hospital is an insider, you know? So <laughs> just now, you, know, you work inside is an insider, no such thing. Right? So, so long. So now, how? Cry until no tears left, law. <laughs> ah, so, okay. Peter um, got something to say. Just to continue on his point when you talk about insider. So for AK case, I, I believe that his his friend is a, actually an employee in the company. But you, to understand the dynamics of how office or, or business work is, usually the employees are always complaining and there's a lot of politics. So, uh, so when we talk about insider, right, when you get really get secrets or insider, it's really from the top management people. 
Oh. They don't they don't complain, but they are the one that running the actual business instead of they are the one that doing the low level stuff. Yeah, they are the ones that's exploiting you, lah. You know, <laughs> don't say so bad, lah. People are making money, so uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So just remember, always uh listen the information with a piece of uh piece of salt. Sorry. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's just best to go do your own research. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you want to see whether really good or not, lah. You see whether the insiders are buying the stock or not, lah. If the insiders are buying the stock, ah, uh, that means something good is going to happen. They are not going to put their own money at yeah. risk, ma. Okay. Uh. All right. Uh, let's take some of the questions that you've been asking live uh, so far, and uh, we may pick a couple of them before we go back to the questions that many of you have submitted. So um, let's just ask Victor about this one. It's about the fourth telco. I think you've covered this before on the mm -hmm. fifth person. So I think Daryl here wants this was an update. So what do you think? What do you think of the possible impact of the fourth telco for like Starhub? Uh, and what do you think of the recent partnership between Starhub and M1? If if you have any views about it. Okay, the fourth telco is going to be a very big impact in uh, for Starhub, especially. Okay, and moving forward, generally, I felt that I feel that Starhub probably will get, going to have their earnings reduced. Mm. Okay, uh, I give a reason, uh, example of a scatterbug that done by Rusmin. Okay, so basically, Rusmin, uh, his whole household signs the hubbing strategy. Mm -hmm. So they basically size the phone line, the mobile, the, the mobile, the cable TV, cable TV, and the broadband. And the broadband. Yeah. Okay. And recently, Starhub give that his bill is used to be very high, and Starhub gave him a no brainer deal. I can't remember how much, but it's a it's a lot of percentage cut. I, I get a, actually get twenty five percent discount. Twenty five percent discount <laughs> for me. Right? Yeah. So so they are trying to lock in all their customer right now, and mm -hmm. and 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 they say it's twenty five percent discount. Okay, so imagine all the hubbing strategy customers are, uh, are getting a 25% discount. Do you expect their earnings to continue to be the same in the, in the next one or two years? No, it's not, it's not going to be the same. Okay. And Starhub always have been very proud of their own hubbing strategy. But if you look at Starhub M1 and Cynthia, right? If your hubbing strategy is really working, the churn rate, which is what the... Uh, uh, the telcos you say that uh the number of customers defected yeah leaving to, yeah. leaving them to yeah. another uh, telco everyone is at the industrial rate industrial average mm -hmm. okay everybody's hitting the same amount of churn rate mm -hmm. so there's no different between the the m1 the starhub and Sintel. Mm -hmm. okay so basically if, if they just prove that the hubbing strategy actually is it don't really seems to be working Mm. And if it's work, really working, mm -hmm. they should not be giving so much of a discount from the existing plan. Well, for me, I mean, because we have a lot of lines there as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right? actually, Rusmin want to cancel the startup yeah. deal actually. Yeah. But, yeah. Because they give him a, a, you know, a huge discount yeah. and it's a very, very no-brainer. As a value investor, it's a no-brainer deal. Of course, you take. Mm -hmm. So you notice that they are going very, very competitive. Mm -hmm. So in the probably one or two years down the road when the real tel the telco is coming in, it will really affect all these players, okay? Even though they, yeah, M1 and Starhub working together, mm -hmm. they, it will definitely affect them. All right. right. So, I mean, uh, Deji, do you have any views about this? I mean, do you, do you... Tomorrow I sell my Starhub shares, law. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean... It's I... not a recommendation of <laughs> Don't listen to him. <laughs> uh, I, I actually bought more yeah, yeah. when the price dropped to below 280 mm -hmm. and I blocked about it. Yeah. Um, I like to think that all investments are good at the right price, mm. but just don't ask me why it's the right price. Mm. Um, I just instinctively feel that if the new telco, the, when the new telco comes, they're supposed to start operation in 2018. Mm -hmm. So there's another one year plus to go. Mm. It won't be so smooth sailing. Uh, it will take time for them to gain traction. And um, I don't know if they're going to offer cable vision. I don't think so, right? Not yet, right? Yeah, so I think M1 will be more impacted than Starhub. Uh, I mean, uh, logically speaking. Mm -hmm. And actually, my experience is quite different because for me, right, I see people switching to Starhub. Right? Like my sister recently, she moved and then she stopped Singtel, she moved to Starhub. She mm -hmm. says Singtel is terrible, the broadband and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's... Uh, oh, well, I, 
<laughs> okay, but I, I, have a, I have a personal beef with Singtel because <laughs> since they screwed up their Premier League uh, season. Ah, <laughs> so many years ago, they did, uh, uh, I don't want to. You want your, you want I'm your never going to go to Singtel. <laughs> revenge. Yeah. I'm going to so stay. So for you, it's, uh, it's, it's personal. I'm stuck. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you see, so uh, I mean, there are detractors, supporters, and all that kind of thing. But I think uh, you know, if Starhub, you get in at a uh, relatively good price, you know, which I think two seventy something is pretty cheap, like you don't agree, right? No, no, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the industry is going tough in the next one to two years. Yeah, okay, I'm not saying that you should sell Starhub or you should buy Starhub. Uh, but, but what I'm saying is that probably now, this is the earnings that they, they have. Yeah. And they're going to give you the dividend based on this earning. Yeah. So mm-hmm. can you take a 25% cut on this current earnings in the next one to two years when nice. the new telco come in? So if the current cut of the 20%, uh, 25% of the current earning pay out a, probably a dividend yield of 5%, are you okay with it? And, right. I, and I think that you also have to make a distinction as to, because now we're all talking like consumers yeah. of, for Starhub, right? Because yeah. well, Starhub also has that uh, business, business mm-hmm. and the price business, which they have been going in very strongly. And actually that has been contributing more to their earnings. Mm-hmm. And, and that one seems to be a growing segment for them. So even though they give you more discount over here, if they are able to make up for it somewhere else, you know, but Hokkien say Kya Teng Po Te, right? Chi Chang Pu Tuan, right? Yeah, so you make up for the shortfall right, somewhere right. else, then it's okay. Yeah. So I don't know whether you have explored how well they are doing, because I recently read a report about how well they're doing where their uh, uh, commercial customers are concerned. Um, and it's actually expanding quite quickly. So ask Victor to do more research and write another article on Starhub <laughs> and what they are doing with the commercial and Actually, we did it we, we shared it during the, I think the investment quadrant meetup or something. When was this? It was, I think, last year. Uh, now this year already do another one. <laughs> it was uh, an update on the compare the, the results yeah. and you see if they are enter uh the, what they are doing with the commercial entities are actually picking up yeah. and uh, the, the picking up the slack. Then there's yeah. I think there's less reason to worry about Starhub. There's more reason to worry about M1. Mm. Definitely, definitely. It's, but it's but all for all my take is is you have to always be conservative in your calculation. Okay, I I, I do not want to take in the, the business unit because I want to be conservative. Okay. If I'm conservative and yet I can accept this U and this U is give me a very cheap price to get a higher U, my downside is covered. Okay, I'm going to do all readers, all viewers a favor. Victor, what do you think is a fair price to go in? Well, I was yeah. he's putting you on the spot right yeah, now. I can because I'm a startup it. shareholder. Yeah, he it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. I have a medical really calculator. Really to... Oh man, you uh, are evil. Uh, have no calculate. calculate prices here, okay? Uh, <laughs> But anyway, no, you were saying no that you, you, you bought it at 280, you two, think, two you think seventy plus. 275 is a good price. I think. didn't say 275, 270 plus. Yeah, yeah okay, 270 plus. So I, And this is a good price also because, you know, it's... it's Wow. I, 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 I should not say out the price. So now I block about it. Well, so I yeah, it's it's really, say, oh, AK buy at two seventy. Also, public, public, public you you will buy lower than AK. You are safer, lah. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Anyway, I'm gonna get uh, you off the hook. So yeah. if uh, if you if you want to know Victor's answer, then maybe you will do a blog article on that, and then you do after you do just his research, which is research and everything, and uh, we'll see what we come up with. But uh, okay, that was a good discussion on stuff. So as you see, as you see, we have different um. The investors have different opinions. You, you, you. It's, it's, it's normal. Yeah, he's always against me. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. So I mean, it's the same company. Everyone's looking at the same information, but everyone can have different opinions, and uh, sometimes both could be right. You know, who knows? All right, let's go back to the questions that we have uh, that have already been submitted because uh, I'm going to give some priority to these to these people who sent in their questions earlier. So we have a viewer from Malaysia. So welcome, Kelvin. Uh, he is, is uh, he's saying, hi, fifth person, uh, good job in organizing the webinar. This is Kelvin from KL. So welcome to this live, uh, live webinar. This is your first time listening to the webinar. So his question is, um, you know, given, given the challenging retail landscape in Singapore, would there be a high possibility that landlords such as Capital Mall will experience negative rent, rental reversions? Let's just take this first question first. Any, uh, any opinion? Yeah, give it to the free sky. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have a stake in Capital More Trust, but actually I did a blog post on Capital More Trust some time back because I was looking at it. Um, I think it's a very well run REIT, mm. very well managed, uh, and I'm, I'm a Capital Star member. You know, they really know how to encourage shoppers to go to their malls, you know, they reward shoppers and stuff like this. 
Uh, but unfortunately, yeah, like, you know, uh, the retail landscape is changing. Like, it's all this disruption technology that's going on. I buy a lot of things online these days. You know, so I, I only go to the malls if I have I have to. You know, I, I, I rather stay at So home. what do you go for the mall to the mall for? Well, the experiential stuff, you know, you know, you want to go and eat Xiao Long Pao, right? You cannot order Xiao Long Pao from China, you know, and expect them to send <laughs> you. You have to go and yeah, eat yeah. at Ding Tai Fong, Ding Tai Fong, Ding Tai Fong. And, um... We know you own Ding Tai Fong. So, um, I think you will see more and more uh, experiential uh, businesses, you know, in the malls, and then shops which are selling clothing and stuff, all, all this will die a natural death, like, you know, slowly and you go to the cinema, you get full surround sound and stuff. Unless you you have a home theater system, you can't get the same effect. You know, you want to watch 3D on big screen stuff. But so the theaters will continue to do well, despite some people saying that they will you know go the way of the dodo many years ago. But you know, this yeah, I still enjoy going to the yeah. To the cinema. Go on Tuesdays because you go on Tuesdays, Golden Village. If you are a Golden Village member, it's six dollar fifty cents. You know, this is we see cheaper. I don't know. I have always go on Tuesdays. I never go to the cinemas on any other days. Only Tuesdays. Mm. Less people, so. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, let's just take one more question from Kelvin. Well, I want to add on. To yeah. Okay. The, go ahead. Kelvin, okay. Like, like, like you all understand that. Um, so there's all this disruption coming into the um, uh, e-commerce, which disrupting the retail scenes also, as especially. Okay. Uh, but if you think from another point of view, uh, what they are disrupting is all those probably maybe the suburban mall okay but of course the suburban mall um uh, a lot of our local uh our residents will all continue to go to suburban mall but what i'm trying to say is think from another point of view which mall may not be disrupted by the e-commerce so let's say for instance paragon mm -hmm. so it's paragon owned by sp streets yeah right? yeah so paragon is a luxurious uh more yeah. right? they sell all this branded stuff and i believe that not everybody or probably not a single soul will want to buy louis Vuitton or online or hermes or chanel or yeah online. i mean yeah. i wouldn't yeah. spend fifteen thousand on a watch yeah. on a jaeger le Coup and yeah. buy it online yeah. <laughs> where it's gonna come yeah, <laughs> yeah. because yeah. we thought it's a fake take one yeah. so you can think it from another way to get another idea and a perspective uh about the malls yeah yeah. Okay. So, so there are still pockets of uh, areas where you, you still have to go to the mall just to, to yeah. shop, yes, yes, yes. enjoy yourself. The mall won't disappear. The, mall. the yeah. malls the won't disappear. Yeah. yeah. It's just probably transit to more F and D. If you notice, there's a lot of F and D. But I think he is now. worried about their revenue being impacted and stuff like that. And you're doubly worried because interest rates are going up, and it's going to go up three times this mm -hmm. year. You know, that's the forecast. So. So you have to choose your risk properly. Frankly, I think CMT now is uh, not cheap, la, you know, uh, you look at it, it's, what's the yield now? Five point something percent, I think. I don't know, we haven't uh, checked it out. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't think it's cheap, you know, yeah. so, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe just one more question from Kelvin. You were saying earlier um, that CMT is run very well. Any, do you, do you know of any examples of REITs in Singapore that are run really terribly, the bad corporate governance? Well. I have big exposure to industrial REITs, so I can tell you Sabana REIT is very badly run. Wow. Okay. I, I've said that in my blog uh, yeah. many times, uh, and that's one reason why I reduce. It used to be one of my big five um, investment in S REITs. You know, um, IPO, then the price fell to 80 something cents. It was during the fiscal cliff uh, fiasco, and I bought more. And, and it went up to $1.30 something and then uh, the yield was pretty good it was a double digit yield for me then then they did some fun, funny business like buying a warehouse that's only 50 percent occupied and couldn't find tenants and uh and then they they keep doing acquisitions and sale and of course they get their fees um and the impression i got was uh they're more self-serving than shareholders they, they serve themselves more they're there for the fees and um so that's an example like, and then and that's when their own when the insiders <laughs> the major shareholders and i say we're, we're thinking of selling our stake oh my goodness <laughs> it means they their interests are no longer aligned with unit holders they, they don't care because they are they don't have any skin in the game anymore mm -hmm. also and you look at sabana it's a disaster like you know the price is now 30 plus cents i think the ipo was uh what more than what, almost a dollar or something i can't remember 
Yeah. Uh, no, thank you. I just like to drink water before him because I know he can't drink water. He won't take out his mask to drink water. Yeah. Yeah. So you, I, I, I cut my exposure, you know, and it, it still turned out to be a good investment. I think my return was like thirteen percent per year, you know. Uh, I, I, um, and then recently they have a rights issue. I think to, today is the last day. I, I think close already. Nine thirty is the last time. Uh, is a closing. Uh, the, the deadline yeah. but i would like to say that again what peter lin says you know all investments are good at the right price mm. so someone actually asked me about sabana with rice issue so whether it should take part and stuff like that so i say the rice issue at 25.8 cents probably give you enough margin of safety but if you ask me whether i'll buy somewhere at 35 cents i'm not sure you look at sabana Reed, last year i think that dpu dropped by 20 plus 30 percent mm -hmm. one single year <laughs> that probably break guinness book of record like there's such a thing in guinness book of record so if you think that you know this year maybe the same thing will happen again then what is acceptable to you so you know after the rights issue you can do the calculation if you think it's a four cents dpu a four cents dpu 35 cents you buy is more than 10 percent. but if it drops 30 percent, then you're going to get 2.8 cents dpu it's going to be less than 10 percent but if you go for the rights issue, it's 25.8 cents. It's still more than 10%. So I think if you subscribe to the rights, it's okay. But if you buy some more, then and you expect more than 10%, you could be disappointed. Could be, huh? yeah. I mean, who knows? Maybe, you know, they turn over a new leaf and then they suddenly do very well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's just stay on the topic of REITs since we have so many. We have quite a few questions about REITs since, oh, really? uh, okay. since I think because you're around. So uh, KK has a question here. I mean, Victor can, can, can answer this as well. Uh, uh, for a read, how do you determine its, its uh, cheapness relative to its quality? For example, if you go by DPU yield, how much yield should we expect after considering the quality and the risk of a read? So, this is a very difficult question to answer because it's so hard to quantify something like this. There's a lot of qualitative element involved. right? Management's quality. How do you quantify management quality? You know, So is it just by how much they're able to pay shareholders year after year. That is one way, you know, and, but you must also see how are they growing the yield? How are they doing it? So for example, I say, oh, if the DPU grows year after year, must be good. Mm -hmm. Then you can look at how they do it. Actually just increasing their leverage, the gearing goes up year after year, they buy more properties. Of course, it's going to be yield lucrative, right? but something has to give, right? If now my gearing, and that's exactly what happened with Sabana. Mm -hmm. When they listed, right, their gearing was 20 plus percent. It kept going up. Of course, the DPU went up, right? But then in the end, right, because it, they did a lot of value destructive stuff, the gearing stayed high, but the DPU dropped. So the performance that's good, right, was an illusion, mm -hmm. right? Instead, you want to see whether it is sustainable, right? My largest investment in the risk universe is now aims amp capital industrial it has been like that for a long time i blog about it a lot you see how they increase dpu they do a lot of aeis they do a lot of redevelopment they don't just go and keep buying new buildings right and when they do aeis and stuff like that actually they don't get any fees you know but they maximize the plot ratio and uh then you see redevelop so they in improve value they create value for shareholders and uh, they are able to get higher rent at the same time. So it's not just increasing value, it is also increasing income, right? Which is of course part of value. Lah, you know, so the, it, it, you may can own an asset that, you know, now 2 million, uh, previously was half a million, the value went up, right? But if the income stays the same, what's the point, right? So income must also go up. So you must see how they're actually increasing value. So this is management quality. How do you quantify this? Very difficult. Hmm. Uh, just be more observant. So you're saying there are a lot of qualitative factors behind understanding a read, yeah. any stock. No, just not just looking at the numbers. It's not. Oh as, yes, not how they stock. arrive at the numbers. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, I mean, let's just carry on because Jonathan has the same question. How how do you go about? What are the criteria of picking a read to invest? Uh, do you have any any opinion on that? How do you go about looking at a read? Okay. Uh, yeah. There's there's many things you have to look into a read. Okay. You have to look at what kind of property they own. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where's the location of the property, yeah. which is also a very important thing. And how's their tenant mix? You don't want them to be like one whole building, one single tenant. It's, if that one tenant just change, it's very risky. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what's the property you are you getting? 
and how is the manager managing the, the property? Is, are they managing well? Are they increasing the DPU of, for the shareholder? Or are, are they a very aggressive uh, manager that goes around buying uh, more and more property? And, Which is what happened in Sabana. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So generally, I prefer more conservative manager. They can focus on AEI, which is the asset enhancement initiative. Mm -hmm. Then you follow by the numbers. Uh, are they heavily in debt? A uh, majority of their assets being, for instance, uh, being tight. The uh, majority of the assets are, uh, I say, uh, incumbent assets, which means that they already collateral their property. So when crisis happen, do they have the opportunity to you know to buy more property? You understand where I'm coming from? That means they can they can use those unsecured, unencumbered uh, property and they can take up take up loan to buy new more properties at the correct opportunity. Then followed by the valuation. Okay, we always want to buy the, the company uh the, the risk at a cheap rate so that our you are high and there's a possible upside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, if you're interested in risk, we'll just go ahead and read what uh AK has written. Yeah. Well, uh, we are high law. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, we are high law. Yeah, or, or you can just check out different machines that we yeah, have. We're gonna yeah. launch uh, pretty soon. We'll give you more information if you're interested in that. Um, with besides that, let's just have one more question related to reads, and then we we'll move on to other topics. Yeah. Huh? yeah. So uh, this this lady has a question. I'm not gonna re reveal her name because I think there are uh, there's some sensitive information. Okay. So her question is for someone aged 50 years old with about two hundred thousand dollars in cash. Is it would it be too aggressive to invest in reads? Let's say eighty percent in reads, and then the the rest in bonds to generate a higher yield? Is that a too aggressive and uh, a strategy? Well, it depends on who, who you talk to. La. You know, if you go and talk to your banker, then they say, no, la, buy me so what? I'll go and buy a bond fund, la, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, generally, interest rates are going up. Right? We know interest rates are going up. Yeah. And you know bonds, how they work. Interest rates go up, bond prices have to go the other direction. That's how it works. So I wouldn't buy any long-term bonds, right? If you, are, if you really have to buy bonds, make sure they are short-term in nature, right? And for goodness sake, don't buy bond funds, right? Bonds are safe because they have a maturity date, right? So if you buy a, a three-year bond from LTA or HDB or whatever, three years later, you get back your capital and you get your coupons over the years and then you get back your money, okay? If you buy a bond fund, there's no maturity date, Right, it goes on forever and ever. If you need the money, five years later, if the interest rates have gone up quite a bit, your bond unit trust price might have dropped a lot, and you have to liquidate at a loss. Right, don't buy bond funds, don't buy very long term bonds, right, because uh, you might need the money, and because it's so long term, it has not matured yet, you have to sell at a loss or so. Okay, so basically, I would avoid bonds in a rising interest rate environment. So that 20% in bonds, forget it. Unless the bond is called CPF. <laughs> I, I blog about the CPF. Yeah, yeah we know we are a huge supporter of the CPF. Oh, yeah. I, I, it's not that like I support CPF per se, I support good things. Yeah. Huh? And they've got to pay you money. No? Uh, yeah, people ask me that so strange. <laughs> you appear on CPF commercial, I also never appear on CPF commercial. How can you ask me something like this? It's very terrible. No? Yeah, so anyway, you know, if you're 50 years old, and then what happens is if your CPF has already met the full retirement sum, that means you have 160 plus thousand dollars already. And let's say your Medisafe has already hit 49,000 something, and this is 52,000. You can go and contribute, top up your Medisafe to, 50, uh, to the current limit, like top up $2,000. You look at income tax rebate if you are still working. You know, and then you do a voluntary contribution. Uh, you're allowed, I think, 37,000 something per year. Right, you do a voluntary contribution that's split into your OA and SA. You get two point five percent to four percent over the next five years because you at fifty five years old you can take out your money already, right? If you meet your full retirement sum, so it's a five years bond or five years fixed deposit. However, you want to look at it, you get two point five percent to four percent per annum. Where to find CPF law? Yeah, so no, don't bother with the bond funds. Right? I wouldn't bother. Then as you talk about talking about REITs, right? REITs for the income investor will always be relevant. It is uh, for investor for income, right? REITs is something that is in between a stock and a bond. It's neither a bond nor a stock. Actually, a REIT is a unit trust, right? Um, that's why there's management fees, right? The managers are there. What happens is you have to understand that like bonds, REITs will be impacted by rising interest rates, right? So if they don't increase their revenue, then chances are the REITs unit price will drop. 
right? Because people still want their yield, mm -hmm. right? But if they are able to increase their income, the revenue, then of course the unit price might not drop. So in that way, they are like stocks, right? Because unlike a bond, right? REITs being a business, they are able to increase their revenue if they know how to or if they can, if the environment allows them to, right? Or if the management is very savvy, they can do it, right? So with REITs, right, it's a bit more complicated than bonds, less complicated than stocks. If you can identify some good REITs, you go in, I think it's a good idea because um, the returns are higher. But remember, this is a leverage instrument, right? So no REITs I know of has 0% leverage, right? In, uh, low uh, double digits, yes, but I don't know anyone that has no leverage. Right? So it, it, you are taking on some risks. Whether you have the appetite for risk, you have to ask yourself. Okay. okay um, let's move on to some of the live questions that we have. Just pick a couple and then we go back to our, our pre-submitted questions. So. Uh, I mean, let's just stay on this topic of bonds since uh, we're talking about it. Albert has a question. What's your opinion on Singapore savings bonds then? Uh, are they a good alternative investment? Singapore savings bonds, I think I've got four or five blog posts on this. You can go to my blog and search on Singapore savings bonds. You'll read about it. Whether it's good for you or not will depend on your circumstances and what's your motivation, right? So if you just want something to lock up your money for the next 10 years, right? And you get 2 point something percent per annum, you're quite happy that it may mix a CPF OA, then okay. But remember, you must hold it for 10 years because if you take it out after two years or one year, your coupon is much lower, mm -hmm. right? It's to encourage yeah. people to lock in their money for a longer time, yeah. right? So if you want to put your money, which is your emergency fund in SSB, you still can get two point something percent. Then it is of course wrong already. Right? You know, your motivation is emergency fund. That means as and when you need the money, you want to take out then you are better off putting in a fixed deposit, right? But if you think that this is a retirement fund, long-term, I'm not going to touch it. I leave it there for 10 years, then maybe it's okay. La. But for me, I say I won't touch SSB, la, mm -hmm. right? As an opportunity fund or emergency fund, I don't think the SSB is suitable. All right, okay. Again, this is not investment advice. It's basically opinions by... Uh... Well, I'm just talking to myself. Yeah, he's talking. He's not talking to any anybody. He's... Yeah. I'm not. I here. can't even I'm see anybody. Here. I'm not here as well. Yeah, <laughs> my voice is actually in his head. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a IMH patient. Uh. I always hear voices. Uh. Yeah, so there I heard voice uh, in my head ask me to eat pizza, so I order pizza. All right. So, just, so just basically, just a reminder: we're not giving any advice. We're just sharing what we know from our experiences. So please always uh, do your own own the homework. Home. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, let's just take one more question from the chat. Uh, this one is a bit interesting. So. Uh, this person, Skyler, has a question. I got burned and he's got a mental block now going back to the stock market. Just now you're saying you wanted to chop your hands off. Yeah. So, and he's now only observing that he doesn't dare put his, any real money in. So how do you overcome uh, something like that and, and get back into the markets? Very simple. If you get out of the market, you can never make back your money. You have to tell yourself that. You're out of the game already. Right? Yeah. No chance of winning back already. Right? So slap yourself. Right? You made a mistake. Learn from the mistake law. So what did I share just now? Uh, don't ask barbers if you need a haircut, right? And then don't ask your stockbrokers for advice, right? Yeah, so you learn along the way, la, the do's and don'ts along the way, try and error. Ma. But always keep your positions appropriate, la, you know? Then even if you lose money, you're not going to kill yourself, bang your head on the wall and you bleed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, position sizing is really important. You can't put everything in one stock and go heal Mary on the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So position sizing is based on your own circumstances, not based on someone else's. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So don't give up. Don't give up. Um, in your case, right? I'm not giving you advice. I can consider. Uh, <laughs> okay. So if you say you got burned, right? Were you burned because you speculated, right? If you speculated, that means you bought something. And you think, oh, I think this is one dollar. Tomorrow it will be two dollars. That kind of thing. Is speculation is not investment. Right, because nobody can really say what will happen in future. We can only give an opinion of what we think will happen, but we cannot say it will happen. So if someone tells you what well, really can happen, then uh, you take it with 10 spoonful of salt, lah, then you get high blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, so don't give up. Don't give up. In your case, if you really cannot, then maybe you do paper trading first. Oh? 
you buy something, then you hold, you know, you, your recovery time might be longer. Then one year later, say, wow, price went up. I didn't use real money. Then you bang your head on the wall and you die. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. Huh? What I mean is don't give up. You give up, you never make back your money. Yeah, so, but basically you can't, you can't use this for gamblers. You can't go but back. Actually, yeah. if you are a high flyer, you have a good career, you make a lot of money, your salary is very high, right? Yeah. I always say there's a certain group of people are very lucky. Yeah. They love their job and they make a lot of money. Yeah. Actually, they don't need to invest. Like. And if we have very frugal lifestyle, they save most of their money, right? Within 10 years, maybe they're a millionaire, right? Yeah. But don't they still need to put their money somewhere instead of... They just put in a fixed deposit and uh, put in government bonds, put in CPF and all these very safe things, no volatile, no risk, nothing one. Very happy. 20 years later, they $2 million, you know, if they decide to quit because they have a frugal lifestyle all along, it's enough for them, you know. So I, I'm not in that that position. I am not a high flyer, so no choice, law. Right. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, go back to the questions that we have on our list, and maybe Victor, I'll uh, ask you the next question. Uh, Juicy has a question here. So he notices some stocks payout ratios have are more than hundred percent for the past few years. So why do they do this, and should we avoid the, these kind of stocks? Go example now. Um, no, he didn't no, say. He, just, he, he didn't say. He didn't say. Yeah. yeah um sometimes companies just want to pay out like special dividends and they usually uh, will cross their net profit but I, I i don't believe that the company will pay out more than 100 percent every single year okay you will definitely burn their savings so for instance imagine i'm i'm making two thousand a, a month and every month i give my my, my debt three thousand i think no matter in the, it's just in a matter of time I, I'll, I'll be a, a poor guy and broke so that same goes for a listed company. It's, it's not very healthy for the company keep doing that. And more or less, your company probably won't be growing a lot. Won't, won't be growing because they do not have extra funds to grow the business. No retain earnings. Yeah. So just take note about that if your company is doing that. I think there's an ex exception if you're looking at REITs, right? If you look at the earnings per share, right? They always pay out more than their earnings per share. So if people are basing their investment decision on earnings per share, they'll never touch REITs. Mm. And you have to understand that for REITs, right? You don't look at earnings per se. You usually look at funds from operations. Yeah, FFO. Yeah, so because you, there are non-cash items like uh, depreciation and amortization, which you have to add back. And otherwise, where does the money go? And so REITs actually, they pay out from their cash flow. Right, so it's not paying out from that earning. So REITs will be an exception. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's have a look at a question from Chi Leung. He has a few. I'll just pick a, a, a one or two of them maybe. Um, I think maybe this one Victor can answer. So in your opinion, what's the most important, what are the most important metrics that you can use to gauge to tell whether a market is overheated? Okay, you use the you go to the Bloomberg app, look at the market PE. Okay, if you able to get the market PB, that's the best. Mm -hmm. So you look. Like for instance, the the average P for the US index is about 15 times. Yeah. So their overvaluation is about 25 times. So anything above 25, 20 to 25 is already cut counted as like overvalued. Okay. Above 25 is marble for the US. Mm -hmm. So that's how you, you gauge. This is based on historical averages. Yeah. Yes, based on historical yeah. averages. Yeah. Okay, so you basically look at the PE and PB of the index. Yes, correct. Just to just yeah. get, gauge of you. So yeah, yeah they, US... that's how I always do, do it, and it's so far it's doing quite okay. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's how we go in and out of the market. Okay. So let's say for instance, uh, two thousand eleven, the Singapore market was very cheap. So you can see that two thousand eleven, majority of stocks are in the Singapore market. Then yeah. when it comes to two thousand and sixteen, uh, two thousand fifteen August, the Hong Kong market suddenly become cheap. Mm. So we are a lot of funds shift to the Hong Kong markets. And by January 2016, the Singapore markets are also cheap. So we also shift some of the funds back to the Singapore market. And majority of our holdings are in the Singapore and the um, uh, Hong Kong market. Yeah. So that's how we actually allocate our funds. Yeah. yeah. Before AK, you, you just stay, huh? you stay in Singapore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't move around so much. I'm very lazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how about this question again from Chi Leung? Uh, do you have a minimum holding period for, for stocks? Uh, other than structural changes, what is your decision to sell? Because, uh, yeah, how, how, how do you make a, a decision? Okay. Firstly, you must know what is your, why do you buy the company? So yeah. that's the, this, the theory that the thesis that you build. So if the thesis that you build is not valid, that's where you sell. This first thing. Second thing is uh, the valuation get overvalued. 
Okay, so okay. these are the two things that that will cause me to sell the company. Okay. Or is there if there's a structural change in the business, I'll, I'll sell the company also. Okay. So these are the three things that I look out for. All right. Okay. Uh... Or, or, or probably a rumor. Okay. So for instance, a, a company say that oh, I there's a rumor that this company will be taken over mm -hmm. by this. Uh, will be probably say oh, uh, somebody going to offer some price. The thing shoot up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, most of the time I will sell it. Okay. Because you don't know whether the the rumor will materialize or not. Okay. So I will sell it. If it if it uh materialize, it's okay. I still make money. Mm -hmm. If it didn't materialize, the share price drop back. I can buy that. Mm. So that's what we have always been doing. Okay. Right? But you participated in Blue Mona. Not Blue Mona. <laughs> Other companies. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's good to sell too early than too late. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, Let other people make some money, lah. It's okay. Yeah. Mm. All right. Okay. So uh, Enzi here has a question, and he's asking. I think AK. I like to ask AK's take on companies that are slow and steady. Like he thinks Dairy Farm and Samcorp are slow and steady. Okay. Uh, whether they are, we we will we'll, we'll find out. Uh, so slow and steady companies, you know, where the fundamentals and share price is generally stable versus like shots in the dark that could pay off like Apple, key things or Gunting Singapore. So um, his, okay, that's not really a question, but <laughs> <laughs> that was a statement. Okay, let's go to his next question. His next question is, what's your take on the risk and reward for companies? I think the two different types of companies. What yeah. types of investments? I guess the slow and steady ones versus the, the ones that are more long shot. What is your take on the risk and reward? Well, um, you can, uh by Peter Lynch book, uh, yeah. you know, uh, one up on Wall Street. He classifies stocks into five different types, you know. Then yeah. you have the market stalwarts, which is probably the slow and, st the slow and steady type, you know, they, they are big, mature, they pay dividends, you know, and uh, practically fortresses, unshakable. Those are very good for income investors, la. you know, already the heart cannot take too much excitement, you know, income comes in regularly, you are quite happy. You know, um, and actually, some of these are especially good if you are able to get in at a very good price. So that's why make the market is very depressed and all the prices are down. You go in, you're getting a higher yield. You can hold forever. You know, like during the global financial crisis, I told a lot of people that so many stocks in Singapore, you can buy at that price and hold forever. You never have to sell. Right? Just take the dividends enough. You know? mm -hmm. So um, then you talk about those long shot, right? Or the flash in the pen or something. What happens is I share this pyramid in my blog, right? Uh, asset allocation, right? Right. The base is uh, your cash position, then the investment for income, then income and growth, then growth, then right at the tip, right, is what we call speculative position. So it's okay to speculate, right? Mm -hmm. All of us have a bit of gambling blood in us, right? You know, we're all Chinese here, three of us. I'm sure we gamble a bit. Chinese New Year's coming. Yeah, total <laughs> Chinese New Year. Every year, total Chinese New Year, I sure buy one. The you know, jackpot is millions of dollars. You know, if I strike, I, that's it. I disappear. You don't see me anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now you see me, but you don't see my face only, right? Next time, you don't see me at all. Yeah. yeah, so what happens is keep your speculative position small. So what happens is the tip of the pyramid. That means it's a very small percentage of your entire portfolio. If your spotting should go spotty and it goes bad, <laughs> like banana, it goes spotty, then rocks and go, goes. At least it's not going to hurt you very badly. Right, so you have to size that position very small. So for my, for my for my case, right, my speculative position, the tip of the pyramid, is not bigger than my passive income for an entire year. Mm -hmm. So if my investment goes bad, it takes me one year to recover. Mm -hmm. Right, so you can size it any way you want. Uh, maybe it's two months of your salary or something. Let's make sure it's something can recover easily from. Yeah. So, but if it is the stalwarts, right, you can. It's quite safe as long as you get in at a good, 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 good price. So if I ST Engineering, right? Mm. No, a recommendation, uh, but I mean, I started buying at 155 uh, and I kept buying, buying, buying. And now if the price drops below $3, I buy again, free, free, was what I did before. So, and then I just take the dividends, no? You know, it's a very steady company, just take the dividends. Not very exciting, like, you know, like people like Victor say, yeah, you're also boring. You know, yeah, but for me, okay, okay. It really depends on your personality. Your what, motivations. What you like, what you prefer. Yeah, what are you mm. after? And what's your financial situation as well? Yes, yeah. use the right tools yeah. for your situation. All right, okay, I think we covered a lot about REITs and stocks in general. Let's talk about ETFs. I think we haven't, this is just one question from Jason. So what he's asking is STI ETF, a good, a good call. Okay, so would you recommend it? <laughs> 
I mean, we're not going to recommend anything, but what do you think of ETFs in general or the STI ETF? The STI ETF is fair value. Fair value? Yes. A lot of the markets have recovered, and now I would say the majority of the markets are in. The Asian markets majority are in fair value or slightly above fair value, where the US is already at the overvalue uh, region, but not yet at the bubble. Mm -hmm. So the market right now is not as cheap as, as what I, I can see. So... Yeah, so that's why we are always sitting on the fence waiting for the next opportunity again. Okay. It again depends on what the what he wants to yeah. do. Yeah. You know, if if he's thinking of trading or something, right, then an ETF is of course a poor choice. You know? uh, but if you're thinking of getting exposure to a basket of stocks, you know, and you want exposure to their performance, but you don't know which one to buy. Mm. You know, you buy a basket, so that's an ETF. Then uh, you can, there's POSB Invest Saver, there's OCBC Blue Chip Investment Plan. You can go and compare. I blog about, uh, one of my guest bloggers, Matthew Sia, blog about both of these is in my blog. You can go and read about it. Mm. Um, but investing in ETF, right, you want to benefit from the dividend. You want to uh, benefit from the long-term growth. Like Warren Buffett says, right, he doesn't know what the stock market is going to behave like in the next few weeks and next few months, but he knows over a very long period of time it's going to go up. Yeah, so if you have a long-term horizon, ETFs probably. So again, it really depends on the instruments, the, the tools, the right tools for your own situation. Use the right tools yeah. for your motivations. Yeah. So ETFs have a place, especially if you're a lazy investor, you know, you do want analysis. Yeah. In, in, in the individual stock, you can just buy a basket. There's still volatility yeah, for sure because it tracks the stock market. Yeah. But if you are at that time, you cannot take volatility one, ah. Huh? CPF lah. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to CPF. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, I think uh, it's almost it's been an hour in this uh, webinar. Let's uh, take a few more questions. We'll wrap up. Uh, over time, ah. It's oh you know, yeah. I mean, then you have to buy me supper. Uh. Yeah, we'll buy you uh, supper. Uh, and you can take off your mask after that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you need to eat, you know. You yeah, take yeah, it off. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't bring you around like that. Yeah. Um, so a few more questions uh, because we have a special guest tonight, and we just drag it on a little bit longer. So a few more questions. So let's end off with a few questions about um, moving forward. Okay. Um, Okay, Kelvin has a question here. Without using a crystal ball, yeah, of course not. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what, how do what do you think is how do you think twenty seventeen and twenty eighteen will pan out? And what is do you have any strategy? Isn't that using a crystal ball? <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> it's asking for your opinion, ma. Yeah, it's, there are no facts about the future, only opinions. Right? Yeah, it's always opinions. Yeah. no one knows for sure. But what do you think? If you have anything, if not, it's fine. You say, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Interest rates are going to go up. That yeah. one we know is for sure. That's for sure. Yeah, so they say three times, and then DBS or some other research house say it's going to be more than three times. So interest rates are going to go up. Mm. So interest rates are going to go up. From a personal finance point of view, right, if you have huge debt, you have a huge mortgage, stuff like this, right, I hope you have been prudent enough to put aside money to pare down your debt, you know, um on a personal finance basis mm -hmm. you know if we are indebted then you might have to worry mm -hmm. you'll be sweating bullets oh. yeah then from investment point of view like i said like, i know which are your investments that might be badly in impacted negatively impacted by rising interest rate you have to know and then which are the ones which are strong balance sheets and they are not so doing so much in affected and which are the ones which will actually benefit from rising interest rates yeah, so at least this in general, you get an idea. No, you don't need a crystal ball for this. You just need a bowling ball. Phew, you're lucky you get struck. <laughs> you know? So um, I think that's all. Uh, you know, with Donald Trump going to the White House, uh, you don't know what will happen. Uh, how you know? Yeah. He's going to relax all the regulation mm -hmm. on the business side. It'll be interesting to yeah. see how it's Which is going to be good for banks. It's, you know? good. Yeah. it's going to be good for banks, which is why, you know, I... I, I will create a bubble. Probably, maybe. Um, then good lot of DBS become thirty dollars. I sell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. I think Sam has a question. So what? What about the oil and gas sector? Do you think how's it how's it going to be in this year? If you any opinions about that? Mm. Oh, sectors. Okay. okay. Oil and gas. I can. You, uh, yeah. Talk. I I can la. So I I tell you a bit about my sing swan, my sorrows. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Frankly, the plunge in oil prices, nobody knew it was going to be so bad. And nobody could even see that it was going to last so long. Serious. Now, this is like the worst crisis for oil and gas mm -hmm. in many, 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 many years. Mm. Uh, probably, many, probably decades. decades yeah. yeah. So if we go by what the insiders say, right? Pacific Radiance, Marco Polo Marine, you know, even the big guys like Keppel and Sambawang, 
it's going to take another two years, a year or two years before they see any real recovery. So you're going to see a trickle down. But that's what they say. I don't know. Right. So this is another lesson for me. I ventured out of my circle of competence and I got hammered. Yeah. So uh but lucky is a small percentage of your portfolio. Right? Yeah, la, it's a yeah. it's a tip of my pyramid. Um no, it's also being um realistic and knowing things have changed. Mm. So Marco Polo Marine, when I went in, for example, it started paying dividend. And it was very promising because they went into OSVs and stuff. They transformed themselves into a business that's not uh, just uh, about barges and uh, tax. They went into OSVs which is, and then they could charter them out for a lot of income. So the transformation was impressive. Then, of course, like, if the oil prices didn't plunge, they would do continue to do very well. Unfortunately, there's always things that happen out yeah, of unforeseen. Yeah, yeah. So you, you because of that, you must realize that using the pyramid, right? It was an investment for income and growth somewhere in the middle. Then you, you could tell that from what has happened, they are not going to pay dividends anymore. Then of course it moves up the pyramid. You have to reduce your position because it becomes a smaller portion of your portfolio. Then later on, right, the survival of the company was even called into question. Right, you could actually tell, you know, then you have to move it into your speculative position. So you slowly reduce uh, as and when is required. So that, that pyramid thing is not static, it's actually a dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oil and gas, if you are in it, I know many people lost a lot of money. The, there could be more pain, you know, but as long as you're not overexposed, okay. Lah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but managing what, your risk again. Yeah, what, yeah, not much you can say, but if you remember this cyclical, right? I, in a recent blog post, I say, right, if a bad performance, right, is due to seasonal factor, you don't have to worry because it's seasonal. That means sometimes of the year is better, sometimes of the year is not so good. So you cannot just look at the months when it's not doing so well because there will be months when it's doing better. Then you even out. So seasonal is okay, don't worry. Some months better, some months not so good. But if the bad performance is cyclical, the bad performance could last many years. That is whether you have the patience to wait for the cycle to turn up, whether you have the patience and the holding power to wait for the cycle to turn up, right? And if the performance, bad performance, is neither seasonal nor cyclical, but it's actually structural, chum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that industry, that company must be able to reinvent itself so that it's able to get itself out of the structural doldrums. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's going to be like Kodak or Nokia or something, like a dodo, lah, you know? So you have to see what is the reason for the decline. Seasonal, cyclical, structural. Then you know what to do. Any any experience for cyclical industries yourself, Victor? Um, when you look at cyclical industries, right, a lot of the times they are up and down is because of the supplies and the demands. Uh -huh. So what I learned from the lesson is a lot of times people are always focusing on the demand. Mm -hmm. But actually demands can't be predicted. But what can be predicted is the supply. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you want to invest in a cyclical industry, always look at the supply instead of looking at the demand. So when the supply is reduced, naturally the demands will, will, will come up because the markets go back to equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So don't focus on the demand, but focus on the supply if you are investing in the cyclical industry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is what uh, one of our other uh, uh, Jin Hao. one of our, I learned from uh, Jin Hao. Yeah, demand is very hard to yeah. predict in the market because it's yeah. dynamic, it's out there, but supply yeah. is something that's easier to find out Yeah. Uh, if you do some research. Yes. So that, could, that goes into a factor if you're yeah. looking at- This is a very big learning lesson for me also. Yeah. yeah. So I, 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 I generally think cyclical stocks are supply not so easy. As yeah. a, it's like a UE car to me, you know? Yeah. yeah. So not so easy, yeah? Not, not, not so, so easy. easy. Cyclical so is really, I really yeah. test you. <laughs> yeah, you have the you know, it test your faith in the industry. Yeah, it really yeah. tests your fortitude yeah. and whether you're able. So yeah. for example, Wilma, right? You know, if you have gotten it in at seven dollars something at the peak, right? Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Years ago. And then now it's at three something. Then yeah. do you throw in your gloves now? I say for uh, you know, <laughs> no, throw in a towel, not the gloves. The gloves means you want to fight. Throw in a towel and give up. Yeah. You know, would you actually do that? Or do you think now is providing you better value and the cycle is turning up? Yeah. What do you think? Victor, what do you think? <laughs> no recommendation. No, I just say what do you think. I never say buy or sell with my right. You see, I'm doing all of you a favor, okay? Yeah, so what do you think? 
what do you think of what? Wilma, Wilma, Wilma. Is, Wilma. It, is, is it is the cycle recovering? Is it going to benefit? And therefore, um, I'm not going to say the next thing. Yeah. Seems like going to equilibrium, but probably not there yet. Uh, equilibrium so, is what, $4? Huh? No, I said equilibrium mm -hmm. is in the, it's trying to match. So you, the market has to, every cycle, right, they have to go back to equilibrium before you can you can distort either, either ways, right? So now probably is at, uh, now it's down because it's this equilibrium. So you have to go back equilibrium and go up again, right? So probably now is so going towards So go equilibrium. back to equilibrium and going up again. Yeah. That's a key takeaway. Okay. <laughs> okay, but anyway, if you want to know more about Wilma, actually we've blogged about it yeah. before. We've about, yeah. about Wilma, but not, maybe not recently, but you can just go to our... But it's a very complicated business. So, yeah. so Recently not blogging about it because you're buying it. Eh? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that to Victor to answer if he wants to. <laughs> but we have covered Wilma before, and yeah. uh, yeah. it's a very complicated business. Please, if you, if you, if you are those who don't spend your time analyzing, Wilma is definitely not the type of business that you should. Even be. if you spend the time analyzing, you also cannot analyze the whole business. <laughs> yeah, so it's you really have to put in effort for this business. Yeah. You put in a lot of effort, also cannot analyze the whole business. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So it's about ten minutes past ten. I think let's want to wrap it up. I want to just take one more question from Augustine. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, why do you laugh? It must uh, be a funny question. I mean, I mean, uh, um, okay. He says, uh, he, "I would like to ask my beloved darling, AK, two questions." So please see the attached photo. There's no photo here, so I don't know what photo it is. Uh, yeah, I did. Oh yeah, yeah. I yeah. think he had seen the email. So it's not a photo of him, right? I hope. Yeah. No, no, right. <laughs> POSB? POSB. POSB. Interest rates. Interest rates. Okay. 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 So what is it? How much? 8.5%. Okay. Okay. So that's 8.5%. Savings. Saving? Savings interest. Wow. Oh. Over how many years? It was a long time ago when I was. Oh, oh 1980. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I was. When I was a primary school student. Yes. Okay. Right. So Kenji is back there anyway. So. Um, so Augustine, Ken, Kenji is back there. Yeah. <laughs> so his question is what is the like, likelihood that you will see? This kind of interest rates again. Never say never. <laughs> okay. Never say never. Okay. And if it really does happen, will income investing be relevant? Of uh, course. Okay. Interest income yeah. is part of income investing. So you get 8.5% interest income from your savings. As an income investor, you'll be quite happy. But you must remember if they offer you 8.5% interest on your savings, uh, inflation is probably through the roof. 8.5% yeah. what? Fixed deposit. Just the same thing. Fixed, fixed deposit, like I think. Fixed yeah. Anyone, but, anyone from 1980 that was... I was only... We were kids. I was only nine years yeah, old. Yeah, so, so anyone older than that. But honestly, if you ever seen your bank interest going up to 8%, I think you, I would rather put my money in the bank because it's risk-free as compared to, you know... But if, it, if it's going to be 8.5%... Yeah. That means the interest rate is very high. It's, 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 to, it's yeah, probably yeah. because inflation is through the yeah. roof. That's why they need to have higher interest to pull no, back which means that the market pressure. is all value at the point of time. Uh, so in order to keep yourself safe, you should put your money back into the bank. Okay. Right. All right. So and oil crisis. When yeah. was the oil crisis? 1978. Was it 79? Yeah, I, I think the there was Iran, oil, cri oil right? crisis. is yeah. history, AD, la. You know, so and then I think that it, there was a very bad bout of inflation and then interest rates have to go up to try to rein in. But you also inflation. must also take note that because at that point of time, Singapore is still not as developed right now. Because as the country, a country get more and more developed, the interest I think rate it was a worldwide phenomenon. Is it? Interest rates were... Interest rates were... Interest rates were... <laughs> interest rates were, <laughs> interest rates were, were, were high yeah. everywhere. I wasn't born at all. Uh, yeah. yeah. So if we have an economist amongst our viewers, maybe the economists can tell us more details. But I'm sure if you Google, you can read about it. Yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. Maybe you ask someone older... If interest rates go up so high, yeah. usually it's because inflation is through the roof. Oh, and John, John say oil crisis. Yeah, so I was right. Yeah, oil crisis. Uh. I remember my parents talking about it. I didn't understand what it was. So, <laughs> yeah, but I, I, just, I, I think I read about it in economics class. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So that uh, was what, 1973. Yeah. Uh, okay, lah. I thought it was, was, uh, was 73. Uh, I don't know, lah. No that was anyway. two years old. <laughs> so you know how old you are now. Yeah. Okay, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, his next question is, when will be the next evening with AK? I want to hug, hug him again to improve my luck for this <laughs> new year. Okay, so anyway, uh, we have no idea when. <laughs> no, like, this year I don't feel like doing it. I'm very lazy. Uh. Yeah. Depends on my mood. Like, huh? Yeah, okay. Mm. Probably you all have the evening with AK with fifth person webinar. Right. No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to do this again. I'm, I'm, I, I told people I'm doing this because I'm repaying a debt. What debt are you paying? 
I'll be paying a debt. <laughs> because Kenji helped me last year to organize evening with AK and friends. So I'm repaying a debt. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, yeah, so we can move on to questions. So um, yeah, I think I think we can we can wrap it up. It's been it's like ten fifteen. Yeah. This is the longest. No aircon, you know, very warm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, I mean, the longest webinar that we've live yep. Q and A webinar that we've had so far, and uh, want to wrap it up. So thank you, Victor. Thank you, AK, yeah. especially for joining us this time around. Yeah, welcome. We really hope you'll you'll be back again. Uh, maybe sometime we, we, not we, so soon but we negotiate like my fees later with supper la. and <laughs> your, your, your supper must be quite expensive i think <laughs> in typhoon <laughs> oh. <laughs> more than that anyway we just hope well we hope we'll be back maybe not so soon maybe sometime uh next uh, decade yeah well not so long la. We'll if, if I strike all Toto this Chinese near, that's it. Okay, right? if you strike Toto, fine. I mean, yeah, that's it. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> right, and uh, well, well, thank you. Well, thank you all of you for joining us as well. So, thank you, Victor. Thank you, yeah. AK. Thank you all of you for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this session. And uh, so sorry if we couldn't answer all your questions because there are already so many of them, and we were, we we're trying to just trying to pick everything and then put it all together and as you know it's already one hour 15 minutes for this so forget everything you have heard just treat this like an episode of the news okay uh, <laughs> yeah so, so we'll see you at the next webinar the next webinar will, will probably be next month or in march we'll let you know again and man says here hello ak i just wanted to thank you for and you're always talking to yourself he's benefited a lot from it man man yeah oh yeah yeah welcome man i'm glad you have benefited yeah, so I give you my bank account, how you transfer some money to me. <laughs> <laughs> give bank account, you know your name, huh? See me? <laughs> I just I have no idea. I just I, uh, trying to scare you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I give you Kenji's bank account, I'm gonna transfer to him, then he pass the money to me. <laughs> okay, so again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh well uh have a good night and we'll see you again. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.